Welcome to the world's most neglected and cheapest E90 M3, which I paid a whopping $11,000 for, featuring the mighty S65 M-powered V8 and slick shifting six-speed manual. In the previous episodes, I spent countless hours changing the rod bearings and saving the engine. I then successfully attempted to custom weld the stock catalytic converters back onto the exhaust. And today I am erasing years of neglect by overhauling the complete suspension and braking system. So sit back, relax, and keep your hands clean. So the crappy BC racing coilovers are completely leaking after only 100,000 kilometers, and to be honest, they handle like garbage. Now the good news is these discs have lots of meat left. I'm gonna take this to a metal shop to have it resurfaced. Let's crack on with the brakes. Now I'm gonna be upgrading these lines to stainless because these are 15 years old. Squeeze the brake fluid out. Here's our disc. As you can see, lots of meat left. These are next to brand new. Now let's hear the hub. That doesn't sound too appealing, does it? Well, what did you think after almost 300,000 kilometers? There's our dinner plate. All right, now it's bath time for the brake shields. I'm going straight to the chemical route. All right, well, these didn't turn out great. The backsides look perfect, but there's just all this crap over here that I can't get rid of. So we're gonna try and paint these guys. All right, so the cement mixer has to go. Batter up. Bingo. Now while we're here and we're about to take out that nastiness, have a look at the edge of my bumper here. Take a look at this over here. This is totally cracked. The bumper here on the side looks like it had a head-on collision with a shark or something. Moving over here to the front, completely scratched up. Not to mention the bottom is mangled. Not to mention that doesn't align properly. There's some weird bubbling happening here. This is cracked. So it's time for this bumper to go and I've got a solution. So here's the bumper that I bought. Obviously it's got some pain issues and it's peeling, but most importantly, it has zero cracks. And once this gets back from the paint shop, it's gonna look splendid. God damn, this thing is filthy. No wires? Bingo. I think some squirrels made a nest in here or something. The only thing I'm keeping is the black grills. Otherwise, that thing's getting sold on Marketplace. So let's take this off, get it out the door. Time to get this nasty garbage out. What do you think? Think it was leaking? <laughs> Sway bar link. Here's a tip for getting off this nut. Put a two by four and a jack and put some upward pressure on this tie rod end. And now that you've got upward pressure on it, you don't need to hold this inner part. How easy is that? And now we lower. I'm gonna loosen this bolt over here and the one down here for the control arm. Now we can go up and release the top mounts. There she comes. Look at that. You can see just how wet it is in there. BC racing, don't buy it. Why? because it's garbage. Now, as far as the front shocks, these are the originals 
2007 production date. These, I believe, have 150,000 kilometers or so, 100,000 miles. Now, I scored a set of 2010 production date shocks with apparently 50 or 60,000 kilometers, 30,000 miles, for a whopping $80 for both fronts and both rears. So now let's pop off the spring and see which of these two shocks has a better rebound when I compress them. Now for all the stance boys and girls out there, why am I going back to original suspension on the M3? Just Google Streets of Toronto and you'll know exactly what I mean. The nut, top cup, we'll put this bomb away for now, up. It offers some resistance. Let's try the 2010. This 2010 was actually much harder to pull in and out. So I'm gonna have to probably say this has a lot less kilometers than this guy does, but we're here, we're gonna swap them out anyway, and then we'll see how the car drives. We want to make sure that the edge of the spring here meets the end over here and this guy up top I haven't replaced anyway so that's going to be all fine. Now for any of you who have been living under a rock in the E90-92 M3 community this little nub here goes into the top of the shock strut on the chassis and it basically is like an alignment pin what I'm going to show you next is, if you take this out, you can actually get one more degree of negative camber on your front wheels. Which, on an M3, on a heavy performance car like it is, it has woefully bad front camber from the factory. So I'm going to show you what that looks like next. Step one, bit of cleaning. Insert a punch here to widen. Make note of the little groove here, and it should fully bottom out. All right, so now that we're looking at the top mount, this is what controls the front camber. And this is supposed to basically keep it locked into place. But as you can see, these holes here have the ability to slot this back and forth. And so if you were to push this all the way out when getting rid of this, you get one degree more camber, which is badly needed on this car. So now I'm gonna take out this little nub and I'm gonna show you what I mean. So basically I'm using my knee to leverage this up and down, and I'm using my thumb to push it as much as I can this way. Short of going with camber plates, this is the best way to get free negative camber out of your front suspension. These are 25 foot-pounds. All right, so here's my goodies from left to right. Schaffler wheel bearings and hubs for the front. These are the front discs that I had before. I had them professionally resurfaced. They're good to go. In the back, I went with dynamic friction, high carbon alloy discs. I've got ECS stainless lines, all six of them. We'll see how the rear ones go. For pads, I've got PowerStop Extreme Z26 high performance street pads, and of course, racing brake fluid and some of those rubber caps that I was missing. This is a very nice OEM plus street setup. Obviously, if I'm gonna be tracking the car I might want to go with more aggressive pads down the line, but stainless lines and racing brake fluid on an E90 or E92 M3, very much needed to augment the braking system, which is a little bit kind of lackluster on this car. Let's go. Time for the hub. So these bolts have red Loctite on them. You got to scrape that off first. So they should look like this. Now apply a red thread locker to the middle. Torque is 82 foot pounds. Now the pinch bolt, 33 foot-pounds. Carrier bracket, 81 foot-pounds. Time for the caliper with pre-lubed ears and the backing plates, of course. For 
the slider pins, you do not need to put grease on these, unlike pretty much every other car. These are apparently exposed slightly, so putting grease on it makes it worse. 22 foot-pounds, and the dusty caps. Final piece is the brake lines. We'll start with penetrating fluid. So you gotta be real careful in these situations. What's happening is the entire brake line up here is rotating, and this nut here is seized onto this rubber portion of the line. So now, we need to bust out the fireworks. If it's smoking, it's usually a good sign. Add some more penetrating fluid. Now penetrating fluid has the upside of being extra flammable, so that's gonna help in the heating process. See that? Almost caught on fire. I think we might have success. Now that is how you unseize a brake line without setting your car on fire. Almost. Now we're gonna take our new stainless line and put it in the caliper first. There we've got the new line. Finally got the sucker on. Time to tighten it down. Done. Last but not least, I installed the brake wear sensor, which clips into this little box behind here, snakes along here to the pad. All right, last thing we wanna do is tighten this wishbone over here, as well as this guy over here, but you wanna do it with the suspension raised. Now, if you don't have a four post lift like I don't, what you do is you wanna jack this up and you wanna carefully jack it up until this jacking point is raised up. Once this jacking point has lifted, we'll know that this is lifted enough that we can tighten it and it's gonna be at regular ride height. So this thrust arm here is 74 foot-pounds and then a 90 degree bend. And it's the exact same thing with this one. That means this side is done. I've already done the other side, let's head to the back. First I'm gonna cut the brake line and insert a screw because we're gonna be replacing those anyway. Brake fluid is spilling all over my crappy garage floor. Come out, come out. Right. Oh, there's a bird back here. Now, I'm gonna save you three hours minimum of work at this point, because as you can see in here, this has about a decade of rust and salt that has seized this brake onto the hub completely. So once I take these out, I'm gonna show you a very key trick that's gonna help you essentially keep your sanity. So what you wanna do is you wanna take this bolt, which is basically the thing that holds the aluminum under tray under the engine, and one of the nuts that was for the sway bar end link. So here is a preview of what I'm talking about. Here's the bolt that we would have threaded in. There's the nut, and there's that little metal extender piece and essentially what this is gonna do is as I tighten it, it's gonna push down onto here. Pop, baby. Ha <laughs> ha. This is like an archeology span dig. Check this out. That's why that disc was so seized onto this hub. Crazy. Anti-seize paste, just on the lip. This contracts and expands the handbrake pad. Alright, I scorched this guy and managed to get a few turns in, so it's not seized. It's now a little bit loose. That's all that matters because uh, once, the, once the caliper comes on, it's going to be a lot trickier. So at least this is now loose. Now let's put the caliper and the fresh pads in. 
Right. Well, I got the line finally in. That's good to go. Unfortunately, and if you've watched any other E90 or E92 channels, see those rusty things all the way back there? There's two other soft rubber lines that go kind of from there to this point here. They're completely inaccessible with the subframe here. So unfortunately, those are going to have to wait until I drop the subframe and refurbish this entire rear end. But at least all four brakes are done now. Time to get this thing bleeding. Time to pump out the old fluid. That's as far as we're going to go with the old fluid. Take a look. Yeah. Change your brake fluid, people. Come on. Motul 600 RBF. Right. Now let's start flushing. You always want to start from the furthest corner away from the brake master cylinder. Fortunately, that side is so tight, can't even get a camera stand in there. This is my little Amazonian brake sucky thingy. Let me show you how it works. You basically hook it up to an air compressor, put this on the nipple, and let it rip. Here comes the nastiness. Check out how round one looks positively radioactive. So now I'm done all four corners, and for your viewing pleasure, this is the color of the stuff that was coming out, and the color on the left is what it should look like brand new. Now while I'm at it, I'm going to drain the clutch line as well. Driver's side, North American driver's side, there's the nipple. I took off the rubber grommet on top, and just be careful because it is plastic. So I can't do this on camera, it's way too tight. You'll just have to take my word for it. See, here's the aftermath. I told you it was going to be tight. Anyway, that's done. Now i got to clean up this mess. Right, so our fluid is topped up. And by the way, doing the clutch is a huge pain in the ass. You basically have to go in there and pump the clutch by hand about 75 million times, and I'm really not exaggerating. And then finally, you'll have a clutch back, and this is now done. And of course, we can't forget about the crappy rear suspension, so the BC shock and that crusty ass spring is going to have to go. And we're going to start back here. We got to loosen that top nut, and then we'll get below. Scheiße Hans, the battery died. Okay, now that we've just preliminary loosened this, let's go below. So, very important, I've got a 2x4 here under a jack. I've put some pressure up on here so that it releases some of the tension on here. Now let's release this bolt and this bolt. It's essentially threaded through this aluminum piece, so you don't want to use an impact here. Now we can pull Krusty the Clown out. There he is. There's the top nut, don't want to lose that. And there's this plate as well. You want to keep this. BC garbage, no more. Now before you throw this away completely, you want to keep this portion because your shock, your whatever shock you put in, this came off the car. This is part of the chassis and this goes up here. So this is what 80 bucks buys you. This is the set of shocks that I bought. Like I said, same as the fronts. 2010 build date, apparently 50,000 kilometers on them. Bump stop, here's that sleeve that I was talking about, and a stock spring. Now let's stuff this cheap goodness into the back over there. And as a reminder, I am doing this build on the cheap. This is on purpose. We're talking about an $11,000 M3 here. I'm going to start with stock and then progress from there as I start using the car and just get a feel for what it needs, what the best bang for the buck mods are going to be. Now before I put back the spring and the shock, I need to replace this here. This is the headlight level sensor. As you can see, the little eyelid here has snapped and uh, the headlights are all wonky and it's supposed to connect to this thing here. So I'm going to take this guy out. I've got a new sensor with a metal reinforced arm over here. I'm going to put this back. Right, new ride height sensor activated. Time to get the spring in. Now what I like to do is grab this bolt here, push down this arm. That way it gives me room to access. Now this has a hard nipple on the back. That's supposed to be facing the inside of the car. 
what seems to be the problem, officer. Don't you want to go home? Good. Time to put in the shock absorber. Good, that's in. Now we can start raising this. If you are reusing your bolts, highly recommend you take a wire brush and clean the threads. And then start them by hand. These are notorious for stripping. And we're going to leave this loose for now. Now you want to take a pry bar and kind of position this eye with the hole down here because the camber is pulling it in a wonky direction. The jack pad is movable. 72 foot pounds for the one holding the shock and 122 for this guy. I put back that top piece, now the nut. Good and tight if you don't have a torque wrench. Now replace the condom. This oil was super stinky. My guess is that was the original stuff. 44 foot pounds. I'm gonna be filling this up with Molly 75 foot 140. This thing eats a lot of juice. We've got a steady stream. Time to close up. Done. Ah, my pantaloons. This thing, as I was walking by, pierced my immigrant pantaloons. How dare you, after I've been treating you so well by putting an M3 on you. For shame. Hopefully something's coming out of the drain plug. Oh yeah. Pissing match over. 26 foot pounds. Uh huh. Well, that's a problem. There's your problem. That's why you don't reuse these. Gonna buy a new one. All right, it's been 24 hours and my wallet is $100 lighter because I have two brand spanking new transmission fill plugs, aluminum one-time use, $40 plus tax each. Highway robbery, I tell you. Now, as far as fluids go, I'm gonna be using a combination of MTF, Liquid Molly Top Tech, 5100 and ATF 1100 apparently this combination is really good for colder weather you get the protection and viscosity of the ATF with the protection of the MTF drink up there we go that's about two liters now I'm gonna gently tighten this turn the car on drive a little bit up and down the driveway shift through the gears and then I'm going to raise it back up and top it up until this fluid starts leaking out. Now the last thing we're going to do in this episode is drain the oil. I've got about one or two hours of running in with this engine. So I want to drain this because if some of you have seen the previous episodes, I've done rod bearings on this. I used assembly lube in the motor. You definitely want to drain that in the first 100, 200 kilometers. And also, I'm going to send the sample to Blackstone Labs and uh, see what the health of the engine is now that we've done the rod bearings. If I did a good job last time, we're not gonna see any metal shavings in the oil, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Got a nice, healthy sample here. Absolutely nothing on the drain plug, which is very important. No metal chunks. All is well in the oil filter. Excuse me, ladies. Mmm, good to the last drop. New filter. Liquid Molly 1060, obviously, gonna pre-lube the filter. Now, one of the things I'm gonna be using on this engine is Liquid Molly's Ceratec. The thinking behind this is this adds an extra layer of lubrication. These engines, anybody who knows anything about them, are notorious for having super, super tight clearances on the rod bearings, which we changed, obviously, but, but seeing as I'm gonna be giving this car light to medium 
track duty, I want to make sure I don't want to take any chances. So I'm going to dump half a liter of this, and then we're going to start with about eight and a half liters of 1060. Let me know in the comments, hit me up if you guys have any experience using this in any of your cars, let alone an S65. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Done. So minus my tragic pantaloon incident, this was an extremely satisfying episode and very much needed and overdue. The suspension and the brakes are going to be perfect for the street for the time being while I shake down the car and check out what else it needs. Speaking of what else it needs, this is a preview of what's coming up next. Then I got to refinish the rims, then we got to do the exterior polish, get the bumper back and do a full interior refresh of this car before it's ready to hit the road and hit some curves, possibly even hit the track. If you've made it this far, thank you very much for watching. And if you haven't subscribed already, I will find you. Just kidding. Ciao.